Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this event uh, to lead off a new series at Green College on Indigenous resurgence and colonial fingerprints in the 21st century, presented by UBC's Klein lecturer for the academic year 2020-21, who is Michelle Good. I'm Mark Vesey, Principal of Green College, and I have the honor of welcoming you to this virtual forum for a lecture and discussion series that we're Zoomcasting from one of the most beautiful corners of the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And it would be hard, I think, to find a firmer 20th to 21st century colonial fingerprint anywhere than the one impressed upon the piece of land by the Salish Sea that now holds Green College gently in its palm. All of us who are so fortunate as to live and work here would love to think that that colonial pressure could now somehow be converted into an equal and opposite force for colonial, uh, for indigenous resurgence, for decolonial resurgence, to put it another way. Michelle Good is a descendant of the Battle River Cree and a member of the Red Pheasant Cree Nation. She's worked with indigenous organizations since she was a teenager. And the way she tells the story, at the age of 40, decided to go about that work in a different way. In the first instance, by taking a law degree at UBC and practicing law, mainly as an advocate for residential school survivors. More recently, she added an MFA in creative writing at UBC, which is how she began work on her first novel, Five Little Indians. Five Little Indians, here it is. Um, on sale from good bookstores everywhere or wherever you get your books these days. Uh, published towards the end of last year, long listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and shortlisted for a Writers Trust Fiction Award. There are probably other accolades coming too, but that gives you a sense of the early reception of this book, which has been um, some kind of uh, enthusiastic acclaim. The John Valentine Klein lectures at UBC are given in honor of a former chancellor of the university and lecturers are expected to be expert in one of the fields of law, business, government, or the arts. Now, by my count, Michelle Good checks at least three of those boxes, which is a record for this series so far. In any case, we're absolutely thrilled to have her as the Klein lecturer virtually in residence at Green College this year to present her own work and to host other Indigenous experts in this series. And as soon as we can have Michelle uh, and her colleagues uh, in non-virtual presence at the college, you bet we will. A very warm welcome, uh, Michelle, to the podium at Green College. That's the applause you can't quite hear all around in the room. Um, and this is now your series over to you. Thank you so much, Mark. It really is a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to talk about, you know, these very critical issues in the 21st century. With me is Kateri Akawenzi Dam. Kateri is a remarkable woman who I am so pleased to have finally met in person this year. Uh, one of uh, Kateri's incredible accomplishments is to have established one of the very few Indigenous publishing houses in Canada, Kegadon's Press. She's a writer, an activist, a cultural worker, um, an Anishinaabe person from, I can't pronounce it, but from the Cape Croker Reserve on the Saguin Peninsula in uh, Ontario. And um, Kateri is a, a very prominent person in the world of Indigenous literature in Canada, and I'm so honored to have her with me today to assist in our conversation um, that we're going to embark on today. I want to say hi, Mary. <laughs> My friend and old instructor, Mary, is here. I can see her, and I just wanted to say hello. So with that, I thought that we would just, uh, I, I'm really giving Kateri short shrift. 
she's had um, you know an amazing life so far and contribution to our communities. Um, and like I say, I'm so honored that you're here with me in this conversation. Miigwech, thank you very much. You're welcome. So what I wanted to do a little bit uh, first is to introduce the lecture series. And um, we've got me talking today with Kateri about some things. And um, our next uh, speaker is going to be Dr. John Boros, who was most recently uh, uh, appointed to the Order of Canada, and I'm so proud of him. <laughs> he is uh, um, an Anishinaabe legal scholar and one of the first, um, he was one of my professors at law school and he was one of the first people to start talking about Indigenous law in the mainstream as distinct from Aboriginal law. He's published something like 28 books, um, and is just one of the most phenomenal, uh, humble, uh, gentle scholars that offers uh, an, a unique perspective, both on reconciliation, on resurgence, and on the notion of law um, as we don't understand it now. We understand law in a, in a very uh, colonial kind of way. And John's perspective of law is very, very different and really quite incredible. He's going to talk to us about treaties and about very um, succinctly about treaties, about the nature of the exchange of promises there and how um, <laughs> one side of the promise making arrangement is able to break their promises, but the other isn't. And the inequity that has arisen from those promises and how those promises are enforceable, but by sheer force are not. And so he'll be talking to us about that. And I'm, I'm just gonna read you a little quote from some of John's work. Um, he, he um, said this, patterns are everywhere. There are patterns in ourselves and in nature and in the work we do with one another. If we as human beings reconcile ourselves with the earth, it will be much easier for indigenous and non-indigenous people to identify the earth as the source of health to correlate how we relate to each other. And so John is going to be speaking about those things, about resurgence in, and reconciliation in those contexts. Uh, the next uh, speaker we have is Wabgi Shik Rice, who is a journalist and an author of six books. His most uh, popular, I think, being The Moon of the Crusted Snow. He's going to speak to us. Don't mind if you hear my dogs, please. He's going, to, he's going to speak to us about the importance of the oral tradition in Indigenous culture and the challenge of being of an oral tradition and being in an industry, the publishing writing industry, that relies entirely, I would say, on the written word. Um, he'll also be speaking to us from his journalist capacity uh, about the impact of the representation of Indigenous people in mainstream media and how that is such a challenge to us in many instances. I'm going to read you a quick quote of something that I'm giving to Wab to respond to so that if you come to our next one you're going to you're going to hear this. Colonialism has always thrived in Canada's press. This is not a shock given Canada's imperial birth and its enduring colonial behavior with respect to Aboriginals since the country's nominal founding in 1867. It's what David Spur refers to when he writes that the colonizer speaks as the inheritor. Larkin notes that the medium of print is strongly associated with the politics of imperialism. In this way, Canadian nationalism becomes imperialism because it shares in the same dream. Further, these colonial actions become double-edged because the mainstream positions itself as rightful owner of Aboriginal lands, as well as inheritor of an English pattern of positioning itself with respect to Aboriginal peoples. So we'll be talking about media in that context, as well as that challenge between the oral and the written tradition. And finally, we're gonna hear from Jessica McDermott, who is the author of um, Highway of Tears, which is a book 
uh, nonfiction book. It is an extensive study of the um, missing and murdered women along Highway 16 in British Columbia. And um, Jessica is very unusual in that she is a non-Indigenous person who has perfected what it really means to be an ally in the sense that she was so incredibly respectful and inclusive of the people that she was writing about, the survivors of the women who have been murdered um, in those uh, instances along Highway 16. And so she's gonna speak a little bit about what that experience was like to be a non-Indigenous person writing about such a critical issue in Indigenous reality and how she could make that meaningful and do no harm in the process. So Jessica will be our last speaker in the first round. And then hopefully I'll get some really interesting people for our next round in the fall as well. So <clears throat> those are the speakers um, that will be speaking in terms of this and uh, in terms of the lecture series. And what I'm hoping to accomplish in these conversations is uh, that we can look at resurgence because there has been resurgence, but there has also been um, things that stand in the way of that resurgence and things that stand or resurgence and things that stand in the way of reconciliation. And those things arise from those colonial fingerprints. And to consider systemic change. And with that, I, I'm just, you know, sometimes there are words that we use that we use so intensely and, and repeatedly that they tend to lose their meaning. And one of those words for me is systemic. Um, you know, systemic is uh, defined as fundamental to a predominant social, economic, or political practice. So now let's put that definition together with racism, systemic racism. Racism is fundamental to a predominant social, economic and political practice in this country, right? And so it is the notion of what I'm trying to, um, to curate in, in this series is the notion that we must, non-Indigenous Canadians must understand that reconciliation is more than the ubiquitous land acknowledgement. It's more than the um, superficial acknowledgement that uh, Indigenous people have rights. It, I look at the term reconciliation, I use the definition from the bookkeeping term, when you reconcile your bank account with <laughs> your statement. And what it is, is to balance the equation, is to balance something. And if the relationship in North America, in Canada, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people is going to be balanced, then there needs to be systemic change in non-Indigenous people need to understand that their world, their entitlements, their things that they take for granted may change in order to create that balance and they must be willing to embrace that change. So in general, in a little summary, those are the things that I'm thinking about with this lecture series and I hope that it will generate conversations and um, um, and uh, uh, research, thinking, um, and a willingness to contribute to what has been started in terms of reconciliation. So with that, I'm going to let Kateri ask me some questions. And we can <laughs> move on to the next one, <laughs> next part of this. Thanks so much for that, and thanks for the introduction as well. Um, it's been a pleasure getting to know you, Michelle, and to learn about your work, and I'm excited to learn more about it today. And I have to tell you, he talked about um, the speakers, and John Boros is my cousin. He is from <laughs> my community. Uh, We're Chippewa, all related. <laughs> the Chippewas of Nawash First Nation at Nyashingaming in Ontario. And um, so you know, he's just, as you said, a phenomenal person. And, and uh, I may have to eavesdrop on that um, conversation as well when that happens. Um, 
And Wob Rice, no, actually, he's not my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe somewhere, somehow. But... You never know. He's also an Anishinaabe. Yeah. He is also an Anishinaabe. Um, so I like him already. Um, Wob's a great guy and really interesting. So um, uh, I'm not familiar with uh, Jessica uh, McDermott's work, but um, it just sounds like a great lineup. So um, kudos to you. But I, I really have to say congratulations to you once again on the phenomenal and ongoing success of Five Little Indians, um, which is, which, you know, part of me, it pains me to say this is your first novel and what a, what a um, reception it's had. Uh, it's just incredible. So, um, you know, I'm really, I'm really proud of the success that you've had um, by proxy, I guess. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's phenomenal. And, um, and so I, I want to acknowledge that um, I, I can't even keep up. I, it seems like there have been a lot of accolades given to the book. So um, congratulations to you on that. Thank and you. you're welcome. Um, so well deserved. I, I would like to ask you right off the top, to start, if you could, by um, doing a reading for us from the book, and uh, you know, maybe setting the scene, setting the context for it um, for our conversation. So, if you're comfortable with doing that right off the top, that would be fantastic. Yeah, that would be really great. And um, so, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about why I wrote this book, about how this book came about. Being, I've always wanted to write a book, but as I was, you know, realizing the trauma that had been visited on my mother, and as I, my entire life from the time I was, you know, sort of prepubescent, I was kind of bombarded with the impacts of residential school, both in terms of my mother's experiences, but also in terms of the experiences of all of my cohort. Had I not, had my mother not lost her status through marriage to a non-Indigenous man, I would have been in residential school. So all the people I worked with, all the people that were in, you know, personal and professional relationships were people that had been through that experience. And I witnessed that throughout my entire life. And then when I started practicing law and I was involved in, you know, some of the discussions about the independent assessment process and so on, and I, and I saw these incredibly powerful people, and by that I mean the survivors, um, <laughs> you know, coming forward and forgiving people, and but also being forced to talk in gory detail about the worst days of their lives. And while that was occurring, I was hearing, as we always do, this constant refrain why can't they just get over it? Why can't they just get over it? It's history, it's a long time ago, you know. And so I wanted to write the response to that question. This is why they can't get over it because these kinds of um, psychic, physical, spiritual harms that are done to people are something that lives on not only through their lifetime but through the lifetime of their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. And that was something I had to do before I died, <laughs> was, was create something that might give a meaningful response to that question. And so I've chosen um, a reading for tonight. It's not very long and it's kind of dark here. So bear with me if I can read. Um, and this particular uh, character, Maisie, doesn't survive. She ends up, sorry if there's spoiler alerts, but she ends up committing suicide. And this segment from the, from the book is about when she first goes home after she's um, released from the school and what that experience is like to be taken away, you know, as five, six. I know somebody that was three years old when they were taken from their family and sent off to risk school. And um, what it's like 10 years later to, to try to reconnect and to reconceive of these people as your family, your community as your community. Um, as one of the, I think, one of the most profound harms and one of the intended harms 
the destruction of community through the destruction of family and the extended family. So I will read about Maisie. <clears throat> when they let me out of the mission school, sister traveled with me all the way to Vancouver and put me on a boat that was supposed to take me home. There were seven of us girls from the mission school and another 12 boys and girls from other Indian schools who joined up with us to catch the boat and head back up north to our coastal village. 10 years had passed since they would dragged me away from my mum kicking and screaming and it was the last time I'd seen her or my dad. When we got to our village, tired, cold and hungry, we were her herded off the boat in single file. Standing on the beach at the end of the dock were a group of men and women milling around and looking to the dock as we walked towards them. For a moment, the two groups just stood there, kids on the dock, parents on the sand. Then a boy from one of the other schools broke and ran, calling out for his dad. The rest of us ran too, right into that crowd of grown-ups who were supposed to be our parents. We were all pretty much as tall as them now, and everyone was looking at everyone else, looking for something familiar, something to recognize. I didn't know what to do, so I just stood there, hoping one of them would be my mom and that she would recognize me. I couldn't pick her out in the crowd. A woman approached me, gently asking if I was Sally. No, not me. Finally, I noticed a woman, her hair wrapped right in a pale blue scarf, standing at the edge of the group looking straight at me, and I knew it was my mom. Arms open, she ran for me, crying. My mom took me home, gave me tasty things to eat. My dad was out fishing, she said, but would be back in the morning. She said they weren't really sure I would be there that day. The house was smaller than in my memory, but familiar. And the whole evening, I just wanted to cry as I took it all in, this place I had been dreaming about for 10 years. My dad came home the next morning and held me so tight. He smelled of wood smoke and fish and that primal smell rumbled me back in time to a thin memory of me and my mom meeting him at the dock, him tossing me in the air, me laughing so hard my belly hurt. He would carry me home like I weighed nothing, my face in the crook of his neck, rough sea salt rubbing off on my face. They told me that after I was taken, no one told them where I was. They still didn't know which school I'd been sent to. I couldn't help but wonder if they'd tried to find out. They must have, but the angry question kept rising in me anyway, and their constant affection began to disgust me. Not so long ago, I was at the Balmoral and met a girl from up there after the expected ritual sharing of who your aunties and uncles are. She told me she was sorry about my mom. I didn't know, but she didn't need to say more. I had so many dreams at the Indian school about going home to her, dreams about sleep, sleeping safe in my bed, playing on the beach at ease and without fear, cooking with her. What I so desperately needed was to be standing on that stool by the stove, carefully stirring under her watchful eye, like when I was little. To be little again, living without fear and brutality, no one gets that back. All that's left is a craving, insatiable, empty place. Miigwech, thank you so much for that. Um, it just raises so many questions and, and ideas for me, um, uh, which reminds me actually, um, if anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll get to those questions um, a bit later as time allows. Uh, so if you wanna just, anytime you think of something, if you wanna put it, um, we'll keep track of them that way. Um, one of the things that uh, has struck me in the last little while, um, I, I'm a professor and I'm teaching um, indigenous literature and I was struck by how little the students knew about residential school. Uh, because I've worked um, with the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, I worked, uh, I, I did work with them for years. And I kind of thought, well, maybe people, it, maybe it's oversaturated to a certain extent. Maybe um, so many of these stories have been told. And then I was really shocked <laughs> to talk to my students and realize that they knew very, very, very little about uh, residential school or what it was. They, they had some vague ideas, maybe, um, had heard about um, Charlie Winjack, but um, knew very little. So 
Um, what is it that you tell people about residential school? Um, because your book really doesn't talk about residential school. It's kind of the foundation for everything um, and everything that happens, but it's really about what happens after residential school. So in right. yeah, in terms of just setting it up for people, um, what are the, the main things that you think it's really important for young people to know about residential school? Um, first of all, let there be no mistake. This was a system that was predicated on aggressive violence. Let there be no mistake. Don't believe Aaron O'Toole <laughs> when he tells students that uh, the residential school um, process was intended to be a positive thing and was intended to educate Indigenous children and prepare them for the new world. Don't, don't believe it for a minute. It's well established in the historical record that the purpose of the residential schools was to I used to think that it was to assimilate Indigenous children into non-Indigenous, uh, Kateri and I have had this conversation before, um, to assimilate uh, Indigenous kids into the non-Indigenous world, but it wasn't. And the reason that I say it wasn't is that if, if the plan really had been to assimilate these kids, where was the support when they came out of the school? Where was the training in the school? There was very often zero education in the school. What these kids often learned mostly was the women, the young girls learned domestic arts and the young men learned how to be laborers. There was no meaningful education for these kids. Those were the roles Indigenous people were to take in society, maids and laborers. Um, and of course, as, and as we see from my book and from the, the real stories of Indigenous people that you can see uh, through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they were just tossed out, you know, they'd hit 16 and they were just off you go. And, you know, the reason that I believe that those um, departures were so perfunctory is because once they hit 16, the government wasn't paying their per diem anymore. The government wasn't paying the church um, that ran, you know, whatever church it was, Anglican, Catholic, whatever, was no longer paying their annual room and board. So off they went. And there was nothing for them. Just nothing, you know. I, I mean, this, this quote that I read um, is based on a true story that someone told me about these kids just being put on a boat and then, okay, there you go you know, 10 years later, just go home, whatever. <laughs> and so, you know, that's, so don't, don't believe for a minute that it was a wonderful system, one, a wonderful intent um, that, that just went wrong. It wasn't. And <clears throat> um, at, at a little later on in the session, I'm going to put up a reading list that, uh, that I think is very helpful for people that don't know the history. And, um, but uh, and I'm not going to go into that in a great deal of detail, but there is some things that that I will discuss. And one of them is uh, the Davin report. There was a fella back in the uh, uh, last part of the 1800s named Nicholas Davin, who worked for the Canadian government at that time. And he was sent to um, the Carlisle School, which was a, an industrial school in uh, Pennsylvania. And he was sent with the explicit purpose um, of analyzing that system and its successes <laughs> um, and making recommendations about whether or not that would be appropriate for, for Canada. And he did come back and he said that he was uh, completely in support of the American efforts to uh, concentrate Indigenous people on reserves uh, to divide communal territory into individually owned parcels and to separate Indigenous people from the wigwam. Those, that's, his, that's his word, is to separate Indigenous children from the wigwam so that the cultural knowledge, <clears throat> the community cohesion would be broken. And that was a primary, primary objective of the residential school. 
And he also recommended at that time that the exact model of the industrial school would not necessarily work for Canada and made the recommendation that the unholy relationship of church and state would be the best way to administer and to operate these residential schools. And, you know, I, I don't know who my audience is here today. I don't know how much reading that you've done on the history and I don't want to insult what you know or what you don't know. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that some of you may have heard a quote from Duncan Campbell Scott, who was the uh, superintendent of Indian Affairs at the time that um, the residential schools were being um, enthusiastically embraced and established in Canada. And um, his, uh, <laughs> in 1907, so when people talk about these residential schools as being such a long time ago, they're not. The last one closed in 1996. Most of them started closing in 1969. Um, and don't think again for a moment that that was out of any sense of these schools failing or not being good for these children. Why that happened in 1969 was because the workers at residential schools wanted to be recognized in the same way monetarily that other federal employees were made with, you know, benefits and pensions and, you know, those kinds of things. And the feds weren't going to have anything to do with it. So they started winding down the residential schools and then, um, you know, the child welfare system kicked in and started taking over where the residential school left off. Um, so 1907, uh, Peter Bryce, Dr. Peter Bryce was Canada's chief medical health officer. And he was commissioned to uh, do a health and, I guess a health report, I guess would be um, the best way to describe it. And he created um, a report that's officially known as the report on the Indian schools, <laughs> which was going to be the title for this book before I fell on this one, it was going to be called Indian School. But anyway, uh, a report on the Indian schools of Manitoba and the Northwest Territories. Now, you have to understand at this time, the Northwest Territories was, you know, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, right? It, uh, um, and <clears throat> what he... <laughs> What he concluded in his report, and I will never forget the first time I saw this in when I was doing research. He said to Duncan Campbell Scott, if we had planned to create institutions for the specific purpose of transmitting tuberculosis, we did it with the residential schools. Um, Duncan Campbell Scott responded by firing him. <laughs> He had made recommendations about um, really about closing these schools and allowing any education to occur to occur in the community. And, um, and <laughs> uh, it was in response to, to Dr. Bryce's uh, report and his urging to um, correct this situation that, Duncan Campbell Scott, who was like the equivalent of the Minister of Indian Affairs, now Superintendent of uh, Indian Affairs. His response to that was, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. I do not think as a matter of fact that this country ought to continuously protect a class of people who are, not, who are able to stand alone. That is my whole point. Our object is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic and there is no Indian question, no Indian department. That is the whole object of this bill. And that was a bill on the perpetuation of the, of the residential schools. Um, one of the books that I'm, that I'm going to recommend is called A National Crime and it's by um, Mr. Malloy. And it's a spectacular history of that whole time and all of those things that, that occurred. Um, <laughs> and the reason that that book is titled A National Crime is because Dr. Bryce was so upset with the response that he got that 
and and let me be clear that if you go to the research, if you go deep enough, um, he was giving reports that in some schools, 50% of the children were dying of tuberculosis. The, the percentage of the children that were afflicted and dying was that high in some schools, which is why I question the official number of uh, recognized deaths in, in uh, residential schools, um, because we know that there were many, many more than that. Um, so, <clears throat> but the reason, <laughs> I digress, I talk in circles. The reason that that book is, is titled A National Crime is because after he was fired, uh, Dr. Bryce wrote a long article for the Ottawa Citizen called The National Crime. And it was calling the residential school system a crime. And what I find so interesting about his articulation of that is that, you know, this, I think it was, it was about mm, some years, not too many, but some years after 1907, when he was sent off to, to, to do that study and to prepare the report, is that he, conclu he concluded that article with the statement that this is no way to treat our allies. And what that does for me is that it puts the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in an entirely different light than how we think of it today, okay? We were the allies. They would have never, <laughs> they would have never won those wars with the Americans if it hadn't been for us, okay? And that is such an important, you know, just these little things, but it's such an important concept. If you can stop for a minute and, you know, think about the term treaty, like would somebody go back to the Treaty of Versailles and suggest that we don't have to fulfill those promises? Would somebody treat, you know, some like NATO allies, right? Would they ever treat their allies in the way that Canada has treated their Indigenous allies. And I think what it does, and I, you know, I'm not finger pointing, right? I think what that does though, is it gives these little, uh, I guess, cognitive tweaks, right? Where you can start thinking about the relationship as it was before it was deteriorated by the oppressive experiences that we, um, that we had at the hands of the colonial governments. So, so that's what I say about residential schools. Um, and, and that's, you know, and, it, and you know, aside from or in addition to the fact that this is not something, the impacts of these schools are not something that are gonna go away because they're not, we did not, experience these schools only as individuals, we experience them collectively. Because when you think about all those little kids in residential school, you must also think in the same moment of all those communities without children. And what were the, what was the role of parents and grandparents, aunties and uncles, but to bring along the next generation. And when you take the generation away, you take the role away, you take the meaning of a person's life away. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> I mean, we, this is something that we will feel for a long, long time, if not forever. Um, we, we have, we are so amazing to think of what we experienced in these contexts and to think that we're still here. That's the only thing. You know, I say that they, that objective, you know, the, that objective of Duncan Campbell Scott, they, they succeeded in so many ways they succeeded. I like to say that I'm the object of the residential school objective in the sense that um, I'm of mixed blood. I don't live on my territory. I barely speak my language. And, and what little I know is because I've been determined <laughs> Um, but that was, that was, you know, the plan was to simply scatter us to the four directions and hope we would go away um, and not be identifiable. So as distinct peoples with rights. Mm. So I'll take a breath there, Catherine. <laughs> um, well, it, 
it's interesting. I was thinking um, what you said in terms of, um, um, you know, this relationship as allies, because it's, that really presses a reset button in terms of how we think about things. Um, so often we're, we've been trained uh, to think of Indigenous people as victims, um, to think of Indigenous people as um, the Indian problem or, or variations thereof, and not as the valuable allies that we were and in many instances continue to be. Um, when we look, for example, even at things like enlistment uh, during the world wars, uh, First Nations people didn't even have to enlist. They weren't conscripted into the military. And yet we had some of the highest rates of enlistment. Um, there, there were very valuable contributions made um, militarily by indigenous people. And so that allyship has continued to a certain extent and within certain parameters, but that's not a, a story that's often told. And so we don't tend to think, I think even as indigenous people, we don't tend to think of that. We, you know, we're placed in such unequal relationship constantly. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to hear um, in response to that, you know, how, how do we think about reconciliation? What does that mean in terms of reconciliation when uh, we're talking about reconciliation? And we have been talking about it for a number of years. And yet there persists this idea really of a kind of um, innate inferiority of Indigenous communities, if not Indigenous families, if not Indigenous individuals. Um, how, how do you respond to that? How do you think about um, what that <laughs> it's such a it, it's such a challenge, right? I, you know, but it's it and I, I have this this thing. I taught a history class once, a third year history class. And I started that class by asking people, what, and it was all non-Indigenous people with the exception of uh, three young women and, um, and a couple of exchange students. And uh, I asked them, the course was called the history of Indigenous people in Canada. Well, no, they said native people and I changed it. But uh, um, I asked them, How, what do you know? First class, what do you know about Indigenous people? And everybody was so uncomfortable, right? And uh, and I just calmed everybody and I said, you know, safe place here, it's okay. You know, what do you know about indigenous people? And so, you know, they started getting comfortable and immediately, almost immediately, all the stereotypes started, you know, oh, a propensity for alcohol abuse. Oh, they get free houses. Oh, free education. Oh, you know, all the things that you, Kateri and I have heard for decades, right? And, um, you know, all of the negative and hideous stereotypes that we, that we labor under. And, uh, and so then I followed up that question with, now tell me, how do you know that? And none of them could tell me how they had learned those things, none of them. And they were stunned that they had these firmly held beliefs that they couldn't identify what was the basis for their beliefs. Indigenous people speak a lot about an oral tradition and how we have learned through an oral tradition. But there is just generally an oral tradition. Ours is very specific. But when you think about, you know, the kinds of people like uh, Duncan Campbell Scott and, um, you know, Nicholas Davin and the Fathers of Confederation, uh, and how they were involved intimately and personally with the um, abuse and oppression of indigenous people. You have to imagine what were their children hearing at the knee of these people? What were these children hearing and learning? Mm -hmm. And I, <clears throat> I wrote an article about that. It's in a, in a collection called Kitsunak, um, our missing and murdered sisters. And it's about this tradition of violence that has become 
so deeply entrenched in Canadian society. And my belief is that because just as we teach our children, you know, how to tie their shoes, Canada has taught their children how, um, how inferior we are and how damaged and, um, you know, and how we're a drain on society and, you know, all of those things that, that we hear from everybody. It's, it's, and that's why I like, you know, sort of uh, offering a definition of systemic, right? It's so, it's like uh, woven into the fabric, woven into the societal fabric. I mean, if you can imagine a, a piece of broadcloth and just imagine, it's black and there's these red strings woven through it and those red strings are, are racism. It's, a, it's, it's a, as inherently a part of Canadian society as the maple leaf or which isn't, the maple isn't an indigenous tree by the way. Um, and, you know, or O Canada or, you know, any of the, you know, icons that we identify as Canadian. Racism against Indigenous people is as entrenched and, and systemic as that. It's so many stories that we hear, um, and all you know, it's it's the stories we hear. It's the stories that are amplified in society, and then the stories that um, we don't get to hear because uh, attempts are made to silence them. And it was really interesting um, in working with my students. Um, that so many of them, they, there were things that they had no idea about. And, and they would say, well, why don't I know about <laughs> X, Y, Z? Why don't I know about um, the history of Indigenous veterans? Why have I never heard of this person before? And, you know, it's, it's, it's those kinds of questions that, um, you know, I think your, your book really speaks to that in many ways, why these stories are suppressed um, and what happens as a result when, when people don't understand, like when you come out of residential school, where do you go? What happens to you when you come out of that, when you, when you've been fed through the, the schools, these stereotypes about yourself, when you've been denied and put down and denigrated and, and, um, kept from your family and your community, you know, how do you learn to identify as an Indigenous person in the midst of, of all of these, um, these stereotypes and these kinds of stories when you've had no access and no other stories to counteract that? So we, you know, we are, an, we have a strong oral tradition in many ways, but on the other hand, there's been so much done to suppress it. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I, I think your book is really, um, for me, someone who, you know, I've read a lot about um, residential school and, and I've talked to survivors and I worked, uh, you know, I spent some time reading sur survivor testimonies, which was um, quite a, an experience of just sitting in this room, reading through files um, that you just have to kind of numb yourself to be able to even to be able to even do that. Um, but what happens after? What, where does reconciliation come in for um, people like the, the students, the former residential school students in your story? Mm -hmm. where, where do we begin? Well, where do we, where do we begin? I think we begin with an understanding and I don't think we have the understanding now. I just wanna run through a couple of things in terms of taking the temperature with reconciliation. Currently, there are 61 First Nations that have boil water advisories, 61 First Nations that have no potable water. Okay. This is not, yeah. And this is not, this is not just a problem of drinking water. You can't even bathe because it creates, you know, terrible skin rashes and so on. Um, 30% of inmates in Canadian institutions, penal institutions are indigenous, even though we are about 5% of the population of Canada. Um, suicide. The largest percentage of, of uh, the indigenous population are young people that are um, 
uh, under the age of 25. For First Nations women, the suicide rate is 35 per 100,000 compared to five per 100,000 for non-Indigenous people. Among Inuit youth, it's 11 times the national average. Um, and for everybody else as well, we exceed the national averages in all the terrible situations. Missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, <laughs> that there, it, it hasn't, the incidence of missing and murdered Indigenous women has not declined since the inquiry and the report on missing and murdered women. In fact, in some places, notably Alberta, it's even higher than it was prior to the issuance of the report and the, um, the establishment of that commission. Poverty. Um, Indigenous people in Canada experience the highest poverty of any population group. One in four will experience extreme poverty. And poverty is not just the lack of money. <laughs> poverty has outcomes that relate to health heart disease, um, educational experiences, the ability to be successful in school. Um, it, I mean, poverty has such a profound impact basically on every aspect of life and on a person's um, future expectations, so to speak. And we, of course, are the poorest people in Canada. So when we're taking the temperature with respect to reconciliation, that's where we're at, okay? We also have lots of wonderful people that are wishing us well. And I don't say that, I don't say that sarcastically at all. There are many, many non-Indigenous people that truly are allies and truly wish to see an improvement of our circumstances. However, as I was um, alluding to earlier, this cannot come without understanding, for example, that there's an economic aspect to this as well. We always get is that we get all this stuff for nothing and we're all on welfare and I've never been on welfare in my life, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and why don't they just get a job like the rest of Canadians, right? And then I think about the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia and the lobster fishery and and I want to make two comparisons on that note, but I'll start with, you know, <laughs> first of all, we're being told we're a bunch of welfare bums and we should go out and get a job. Okay, then the Micmac people managed to, um, to obtain uh, um, a controlling share in one of the largest seafood uh, companies in the world. And then the non-Indigenous lobster fishermen were up in arms about that as well. Um, so, you know, be economic, economically self-sufficient, but only within certain parameters. You cannot control an industry if you're an Indigenous person. If you're an Indigenous industry, you cannot control an industry because you get this, you know, that's the, the response that I see in that um, situation. And, in, and carrying on with that um, uh, um, description of, of what was happening with the fishery there. If we go back a little bit further to when the Wet'suwet'en were uh, protesting the pipeline in Northern Alberta, the big hue and cry across the country was that they were being unlawful, is that the rule of law must, uh, must always be maintained and, you know, they should all be arrested and thrown in jail and, you know, <laughs> And then we have the situation with the Mi'kmaq fishermen who the Supreme Court decided in the mid nineties that their treaty gave them a right to a commercial fishery. So it is lawful that they are fishing in the way that they are fishing for lobster. But, <laughs> but that's not okay either. And then what about the rule of law when these non-Indigenous fishermen were burning down their vans and, and holding houses and 
threatening their lives, literally, while the RCMP stood by and said, we don't see this as a policing issue. <laughs> it's interesting too, um, in terms of your book and the history that we were talking about, because um, as you said, so many, so much of what happened at residential school was just basically um, using those students as labor. So they were working in the farms, supplying food for, for uh, the, the priests and nuns and whoever was running the schools. And they were doing laundry and being hired out and doing manual labor, et cetera. Um, but one of the things was supposed to be, oh, um, indigenous people need to farm. You know, that's, that was one thing that well, we're, we're supposed to do. But the reality is, and this is why, again, we know that it wasn't really so much about assimilation and, it, it, and why sometimes you just think, does anything really change? <laughs> because uh, as soon as those farmers, um, Indigenous farmers became successful at farming, um, they were given like, they were giving farming implements that were far out of date compared to the standards of, uh, of equipment that others were using. And when they were still successful, they put more and more restrictions on them so that they could not possibly compete with the local farmers. Um, so, you know, again, there's that idea, but the, you know, this goes back a hundred years where you, you know, the, the, the pressure is put on that you have to, behave in certain ways you have to do certain things you have to buy into uh, the colonial system and capitalism and all of these things that this society is predicated on but you're not allowed to be successful at it you're not allowed to um, do better than you know any amongst us you, you must maintain um, you know a level of poverty that we're comfortable with you must maintain um, this level of um, you know, chaotic reality that we place you in, so that we can, yeah, yeah, so that we can, we can justify uh, the taking of resources. I think, you know, really that's the, that's the colonial project um, in so many ways. So it's interesting that when you know that that happened then, and then you see um, these incidents playing out over time, my community had the same thing. We won our fishing rights case um, back in the 90s. And uh, once we won, the level of violence towards our community and, and our, um, the, the people in our community who many of whom were dependent on fishing for their livelihoods uh, was astounding. Their boats were, um, were shot at, although the police insisted they weren't bullets, they were projectiles <laughs> that were fired at them. Um, they're not okay somehow. <laughs> <laughs> the nets were slashed and um you know there was just a lot of violence directed uh you know a group of fishermen marched at the farmer's market on some women from the community who were selling fish and other women like farming women at the farmer's market had to literally put their bodies between those men and these women who, who were terrified um having you know like they marched like in military style towards them um, you know, it was, it was astounding. I lived in the community, um, at that time and we were getting bomb threats and so on, um, phoned into the community, uh, you know, so here we go. And then you see it happening again and again over time. And it, you know, you, you have to really think about, you know, reconciliation and, and, um, and the, the potential, you know, when you talk about, um, you use the term colonial fingerprints, mm -hmm. you know, what are those fingerprints and why after, you know, these things happening cyclically over and over again, um, why is this reconciliation um, project, why does it seem to be failing? Because in my opinion, it seems like it's it's a failure in many ways. It's it's a it's a success on, maybe on individual levels, on small levels, but in terms of uh, society, it's a failure so far. It is. And with that, I'll ask Alan if you could put up that graphic that I asked you to to put up about the calls to action. 
that have been uh, successfully addressed and the ones that haven't. Take a look. The ones in yellow are the ones that have been successfully addressed. Okay, yeah, if you can make it as big as you can, that would be great. <laughs> and um, I hope everybody can see this. So let's take a look at that. Child welfare, okay. The calls to action for child welfare, not a single one has been dealt with, neither in education. One in language and culture, and that was just recognizing that we have a right, an indigenous right to our languages, nothing in health, one in justice. And that was a very, very limited one. Um, if we look at it, uh, the one in justice, and if you go down to the bottom to 41, it was the missing and murdered women's inquiry. So of all of the issues that we face with the justice system, the one thing they've done in five years is fund the, the inquiry. Um, and then we see all of these ones under reconciliation. And most of these are one-time things, federal support for sports, uh, long-term support for levels of government for North American Indigenous games, uh, reconciliation agenda, basically APTN doing what it's continued, you know, what it's always been doing, uh, rejection of the doctrine of discovery by churches, and it's just inviting them to do that. It doesn't obligate them to do that. So if you look at the ones that have been considered successful, they're all these sort of one-off situations. They are not, um, they are not the calls to action that actually address the systemic issues that are at the bottom of the Truth and Reconciliation Report. And that's after five years. And, you know, it's so reminiscent of the, uh, of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People of 1996, I believe it was. Mm. You know, all of the recommendations in that, they're still sitting on a shelf collecting dust as well. And I really firmly believe, we can take that down now, Alan, if you like, um, I really firmly believe that the reason for that is because people do not understand um, that the change must be systemic in that meaningful way that I described earlier. It can't be cosmetic. It can't be this program here, this service there. And I'll give you an example. Um, there was an agency that I was involved with that was uh, attempting to indigenize um, a certain process. Um, they realized that, I, I don't want to, you know, spill the beans, but <laughs> they realized that not a single Indigenous person in the history of their existence had taken advantage of their services. And they were horrified by that. And so they wanted to Indigenize that process to make it more welcoming, more user-friendly for Indigenous people and so on. And they found that it wouldn't work in their existing system to do something that was specific in that way for indigenous people. So they just generalized it. Rather than making the systemic change, they generalized the changes that they made to apply to anybody and not specifically to indigenous people. And it's that failure, it's that profound failure to acknowledge and get down to the fact that we need to take some, you know, like if you use a house as an analogy, we need, we need to take one of these supporting beams out and replace it with something else. It's that kind of uh, extreme um, change that is needed if we're going to see some of those more um, meaningful changes that were recommended through the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And it's that kind of change. It felt um, very much when the conversation about reconciliation was starting as the uh, Aboriginal Healing Foundation was winding down and the TRC was kind of doing its work and um, starting to wind down as well that, um, that there was kind of this idea that reconciliation could happen amongst indigenous people, that it didn't have to involve <laughs> Uh, anybody else, you know, that we could get together and have, um, you know, these cathartic moments, etc. cetera, um, contend with the reality of the history and uh, the, the, the broken um, the relationships and everything else that had been damaged. And 
you know, and maybe the government could fund, you know, as it has these one of these projects and things and, and uh, that would kind of, you know, allow a lot of um, boxes to be ticked. But there didn't seem like there was much preparation for Canadian society to really engage in reconciliation. And like you said, if there's going to be balance, if reconciliation is about balance, then both sides have to be involved in that equation. And I think that's, um, to me, that's been where so much of this all falls apart as well, is that um, if people aren't engaging uh, in many ways, and if the system isn't willing to remove those <laughs> those uh, supporting walls and, and re-envision what the architecture of this country could be, then there's window dressing going on, but we're not creating um, any kind of substantive change that could lead to um, a rebalancing of, of really what's happening. Yeah. You know, and, well, I, and, you know, and I, I mean, I'm of an age now, um, you know, where I can go back many, many years and I can observe trends, you know, as a result of it. And it's, I've seen this so many times in my lifetime, right, where um, there is an initiative, but it falls short, an initiative, and it falls short, and it falls short, and it falls short, and it continues to fall short because it doesn't get down to the system of it all, okay, and making those, those profound changes. Um, Dr. Cindy Blackstock, who I'm really hoping I will be able to get for the fall, um, said something. I'm going to uh, share a quote with her um, because I think it's absolutely true. Uh, she says, in 2020, it's time to stop feeding the government's insatiable appetite to be thanked for its inadequate measures and to demand a complete end to the inequality. And that's where I believe we are. You know, I started working with Indigenous organizations in 1976. I was a child still, technically. <laughs> and, uh, technically. <laughs> and, you know, this has been the pattern, is that there's this, this um, uh, inadequate measure upon inadequate measure upon inadequate measure. But we are so accustomed to being, I mean, and our oral histories take us back. I can go back to to stories in my mother, my grandfather, my great grandmother's lives about the violence that was done to indigenous people when they stood, when they stood up. And so, you know, I think that, it, you know, this acceptance, this sort of, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Doesn't quite get us there, but thank you for that comes from, you know, that history of oppression. And, and Cindy, these young people that are coming forward now that um, are emboldened by the work of people older than me and my generation, um, I, I have all my hope pinned to them. So, um, so yes. So, and the other quote that I wanted to uh, offer from Mary Ellen Turpel Lafond, who is another person I'm hoping that we can have for the fall, the burden of addressing racism must come off the shoulders of indigenous people and leaders. And that's sadly, that has been, uh, the burden has been placed on indigenous people who are a compromised people. We are powerful and resilient and we're here, but we're a compromised people. And the burden of explaining how racism in fact does exist in Canada and then responding to it has been placed on our shoulders. The education about residential schools has been placed on our shoulders, on the impacts of colonialism has been placed on our shoulders. And it's time that non-Indigenous people um, carried that some of that weight. Um, and so that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> uh, one more quote, one more little quote. <laughs> and this one is from, um, from Justin Trudeau, and this was upon the occasion of the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Report and the calls to action. Meaningful reconciliation will only come when we live up to our past promises and ensure the equality of opportunity required to create a fair and prosperous shared future. Nice words, I'd like to see that. I agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> and a, and a place to store your canoes. 
Yeah, there's that too. <laughs> so we're now at 611. And uh, so I'd like to, Alan, if you could open it up for some questions, if we have questions. We do have one. Um, are you able to see that? Or did you want me to read it, Michelle? Oh, is it, it's in the chat, I'm sure, right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> uh, the harms, right? This, this is a question asking about, you know, what are some of the harms that people experienced when they went home? Well, the harms that you see are all the things that we're currently, we continue to be judged about now is having been so deeply traumatized. And that trauma started from the day the priest and the RCMP showed up at the house to drag the kid away. Imagine yourself at six years old, five years old, four, three, seven, right? And somebody, a stranger, two strangers come to the door who your parents understand to be in positions of authority and say that you have to be taken away to the school and there's nothing your mother has to tell you there's nothing I can do I'm powerless to do anything about you being kidnapped from me imagine the trauma to that child who will that child ever be able to trust again in their life the parental relationship is so primal and so that's who we turn to when we're when we're little kids you know our parents will always be able to protect us and always stand in the way between us and harm and every indigenous child that went to residential school had to experience that looking at their parents um, powerless while um, under the under the um, force of law because it was law the they were taken away and violently taken away in some instances. Um, the cattle truck experiences are the ones that really disturb me, but little kids being tossed in the back of cattle trucks to be taken off to the residential school for hours and hours without bathroom breaks, arriving, having peed themselves and you know all of those kinds of things only to be then drawn into the school, scrubbed, sprinkled with DDT, given their uniform and their number and um, put into the machine. So the harm started on that day when they were taken away. And trauma is um, an indicator of all kinds of subsequent psychological, psychiatric issues, uh, addictions. It increases the incidence of addictions, of depression, of anxiety, of PTSD, of all of those kinds of things. And, you know, it's like sending little time bombs back into the community of these, these harmed people that are going to react to the world from a traumatized perspective, and as opposed to from a whole and healthy perspective. And that then carries on to the next and the next and the next generation. How do you raise a child if you were raised by an institution? How do you know how to raise a child if you're raised by an institution? And then your child is taken away, <laughs> thrown into child welfare, the, 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 the new age residential school, and you're blamed for being a bad mother. And then another stereotype of the terrible Indigenous parents, it's fostered and carried on. So those are some of the harms. I think um, as well, Michelle, there were so many that um, never did even make it home. Uh, once they got out of residential school, they no longer connected with their community. They hadn't been there in so long. They, they didn't know anybody anymore. And so they, they actually never, ever made it back to their communities for a variety of reasons. And I'm not talking about those who passed away in the schools or were killed in the schools, but I'm talking about people who did survive the schools and then ended up kind of neither here nor there. They didn't fit into the, the towns and so on. Um, that surrounded the schools and they didn't fit into their communities and sometimes didn't even make it that far. Um, so I think, you know, when you talk about trauma, there, there's just so many levels uh, to that and how that played out for so many people. 
Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And all of my characters, none of them got home. You know, two of them went home and they just left because it wasn't home anymore. You know, it, uh, it those relationships were broken as was intended. Um, <laughs> uh, someone just asked me about how did I get to the title of my book? And I have to say the title of my book got to me. <laughs> uh, I had been um, driving around Mexico and, and Arizona and I, I came across um, this street or a road sign and it was called Indian School Road. And um, so that was the title of my book for a long time. The working title was Indian School because that's also what survivors, lots of survivors refer to residential school as Indian School. And, uh, and then when I was working on um, getting ready to submit it to some publishers for consideration, I, uh, uh, it just came to me. You know, I had five main characters and it just came like literally out of the blue, five little Indians. And, uh, and I knew immediately, and you know, very often as you know, Kateri will understand is that there's some back and forth and um, a struggle with a publisher about a title. Nobody, not a single person <laughs> suggested a different title and it really was intended to be the title of this book. And, you know, when it came to me, I was thinking about it and the reason that I pushed it, even though some people are like, oh, <laughs> was because it's a little childhood ditty, right? One little two, little three, little Indians. <laughs> no, and I want them to ask everybody that knows that, where did you learn it and why, right? Um, and it speaks to my, to my concept and idea about this oral history, uh, creating these negative conceptions and perceptions of indigenous people. Um, and then, of course, because there's five, they're there. And because I wanted to say in another way, without explicitly saying this, this book is about the heart of racism and how it can affect um, Indigenous peoples and has affected Indigenous peoples. Um, and I think it says that. So that was that was how I got to to that point on, on that. Um, uh, what's the rhetorical strategy here for reprobing, reprogramming hearts and minds at large? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, what I think is one of the, what I, one of the things that I think is really critical is moving beyond tokenism in um, the teaching profession, both uh, at the elementary, high school, college, university level, is um, that education is redefined as a system to incorporate Indigenous reality, okay, in terms of who we actually are and, um, and what our role was in, in the creation of Canada and, uh, and who we are today and what are the things that, you know, how have we been left by our allies? And, and I, I think that, you know, and then, but before I go that any further on that one, I want to address another issue and we refer to it as pretendians. And I, I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but um, it is about people who pretend to be indigenous. And um, I will refer to one who may be the most, um, uh, not the most recent, Michelle Latimer would have been the most recent that I'm aware of, the director of the Trickster series who claimed to be indigenous and apparently is not. Um, but there was another author uh, some years ago um, who did the same thing. And, you know, let there be no mistake, authors write their own bios. And in his first bio, he identified himself as Métis and, um, and then went on to identify himself as multiple other possibilities. Um, he was, you know, he was exposed and, uh, but, <laughs> 
Uh, he's now working um, as the chief executive officer of an indigenous education foundation. So here we have, and this is a colonial footprint, okay, a fingerprint. This is a colonial fingerprint. Talk about the ultimate act of colonialism where a non-Indigenous person feels it's their right and privilege to assume my identity, to just simply take something and, you know, put it on like a suit of clothes because it appeals to them for whatever reason, whether it's their, you know, dramatic sense of self or, you know, <laughs> whether it's the financial benefits that are available through that. Um, you know, but it is the ultimate act of colonialism, you know, to, you know, they took the land, but now you're taking souls, like you're taking people, you're taking, you know, you know you're putting on indigeneity like a coat. And uh, it's, it's something that, that has to stop. And the impact of that, like the reason I raised that particular incident about this person now working, um, for an Indigenous education organization <clears throat> is that, and it's the same with, you know, non-Indigenous authors writing as though they are Indigenous authors, the grey owl syndrome, is that you are not writing about Indigenous people. You're not writing about our reality. You're writing about your perception of our reality and you are promoting, um, you know, the continued oppression of our people by a failure to really understand who our people are. And uh, Tamara Bell is a Haida filmmaker and she is, <laughs> she is promoting legislation that would penalize people who pretend to be indigenous. And there is legislation like that in the States. If you, you are considered a fraud, we're so sweet in Canada, right? <laughs> it's just, you're considered a fraud if it's called the, what I call star and you might in right, which is a okay. My that is my internet. No bad. Internet went a little unstable there. Um, but if you are not an indigenous person and you're selling art, uh, books, you know, crafts, anything that claims to be indigenous you are subject to legal penalties. And it has come to a point in Canada where I think something like that needs to happen. There has to be, it cannot simply be a non-Indigenous person's prerogative with no consequences, right? To just take identity and to undermine our own agenda, undermine the Indigenous agenda of reconciliation and resurgence. And, um, but on the other hand, Greg Schofield, who is a poet, um, he weighed in on the issue and says, cancel culture is not our way. And, you know, he's right in many, many ways. We are, we are a gentle and forgiving people in so many ways. We will just, and, you know, <laughs> because that's kind of, that's part of who we are is that we're not, you know, lateral violence is not traditional. And sometimes, you know, the response to uh, these things can be vigorous, so to speak. And, you know, he promotes a, a gentler approach, which I understand. Um, I struggle with that in my own sense, in my own self, that I wish to be compassionate to these people who are so unsatisfied with their own cultural heritage that they need to take on somebody else's. I want to be compassionate, but I'm not. I mean, I. <laughs> I, I cannot justify it in any way that a non-Indigenous person is going to stand in front of me and purport to teach me who I am. I think that, um, that there's more to it, though, than the individual. I think on an individual level, you know, um, so many of us understand the impetus of where some of this is coming from, some of these people who've, um, who've done this, um, artists and writers and so on. Um, but the reality in the East, um, and I know you're in the West and, and Greg Schofield is in the West, but in the East, the, the numbers of people doing this is skyrocketing right now. 
It is not an individual, somebody here, somebody there. These are organized groups who are doing this, selling status cards that are made to look very much like the ones you get from the government. Um, they're they're um, fighting. Some of them were, were created by white supremacist groups to um, um, attack indigenous rights to uh, especially indigenous hunting and fishing rights. So I guess I'm in your camp somewhat because I don't have empathy for that. I don't have gentleness yeah. for that. When it comes to protecting my community and my culture, I don't have the empathy and the sympathy in that area. And in, in my territory, we have numerous now Métis groups um, that I never heard of. You know, I'm not that old. <laughs> I feel that old sometimes, but I'm not that old. And suddenly there are these Métis groups that have come up who are being treated as proponents and who are making claims to our territory and getting benefit from that. Um, you know, without so- being able to, Without being able to document their history as being a legitimate Métis historical community, which is how that is, is legitimized, right? Is through that historical research. And, um, you know, I mean, maybe I close my eyes a little bit to it. I'm going to be 65 this year. I'm allowed to have a little bit of peace. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, like that particular author's sister is an advisor to uh, an oil company. She's their native advisor and uh, claims to be Mohawk and isn't, right? And, you know... It, <laughs> You know, but then I think maybe if they get their status card and they, you know, they'll finally realize we don't get all those things, right? <laughs> that they allege that we get all the benefits that we get that we don't, in fact, get. So, but yeah, and in terms of a colonial fingerprint, you know, that I think is one of the most, uh, just the most perfect example of the continuing influence of colonialism. But you know, it's in it's in every institution in Canada. Um, still, the fact that you know teenager kids that are going into first year university, so this is very current, very present. Still, know nothing about residential schools, right? So that's the colonial fingerprint in the educational system. Okay, the media that is still um, you know portraying stories from you know a very questionable perspective. Um, that's the colonial fingerprint. Government that will only accommodate to the point that it doesn't require um, any meaningful change in the way they do business. That's a colonial fingerprint. And these are some of the things that I'm hoping we're going to be able to explore as we go through um, as we go through uh, this lecture series. But really, I mean, ultimately what this comes down to, and, you know, <laughs> in many ways is individual willingness on the part of the Canadian citizenry to behave in a different way, to learn, to be open to understanding what is really, has really happened to us and what it is that we want, okay? <laughs> um, and, you know, con contributing meaningfully to restoring a balanced relationship. Um, so that's what I think, and it's 6.30 and we have, I think one more question, do we? I think there are actually two there now. Okay. Uh, in Ontario, when our board has started, what's NBE? I don't know what that is. Of course, in grade 12, grade 11, uh, contemporary indigenous, just instead of the English courses. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with teachers, mainly non-Indigenous, who are often worried about not doing it right. We continu continually try to build relationships and encourage teachers to draw on the knowledge of community. Other than that, what piece of advice would you give non-Indigenous teachers in this position? Bring in Indigenous people. Um, you know, acknowledge your limitations. I appreciate that, that you do. Uh, but bring in Indigenous people. And I mean, not every day, you don't have to do that every day, but if you incorporate Indigenous people into your curriculum, into the way that you're going to approach 
uh, teaching a particular subject, it can validate what's happening in your classroom. It can give it the authenticity that it requires. Um, um, and hire Indigenous teachers. <laughs> And, and I think they have to remember they, that there's a certain obligation to do it. Um, you know, I think it's not good enough these days to just say, well, I really don't know how, so I, I don't want to make a mistake, so I'm not going to do it. Um, I don't think that's an excuse that holds water anymore, that we need to push beyond that and be willing to make mistakes and acknowledge our mistakes and, and move forward by relying on Indigenous people uh, to come to the classroom, as you said, or to um, hire those Indigenous staff members and teachers and so on to help to keep people on the right path in that regard. But um, I, uh, you know, I'm getting old, I guess. I don't have the patience anymore for the excuses. Of, you know, well, it's, re it's really hard and I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, yeah. it, is it, it is hard. It is hard. It is hard. It's hard. Difficult. But we have to push through that to make change. That's a, lot, right. a lot of reconciliation requires that we go through those difficult periods and we push through it to get out the other side or we'll never make the necessary change. And don't settle for, oh, well, this will do. There's so many Indigenous, you know, just brilliant, capable, uh, talented Indigenous people that are so happy to participate in classrooms. One quick question, because I know we're running out of time here. Um, Schitt's Creek's Dan Levy helped introduce mainstream white people with uh, um, the uh, Indigenous course, Indigenous history course through the University of Alberta. Um, <laughs> is Indigenous history included in elementary and high schools now? No, <laughs> sadly, it's still the same old textbooks. Right, so what you're getting is the non-Indigenous version of Canadian history, okay? There may be some places where there are, you know, sort of, you know, some focused works that are brought into the classroom, but no, not in any meaningful way, which is what I'm doing. I'm rewriting history. That's why I wrote this book, right? <laughs> this is what really happened. And I'm writing another book that interprets, uh, um, a certain volatile time in history through an Indigenous perspective, because that's what I really want. I want people to just, you know, try to see things through our eyes and try to respond in a supportive way from there. Michelle, Kateri, thank you so much on behalf of everybody in the room. Uh, we, we, we've learned a great deal this evening and the impatience that you have both brought is going to power uh, this series forward now. That seems to me the right tone to strike, it really is. It's more than high time. Stuff has got to move. And there's only so far com com compassion and understanding will reach if there's uh, not some constructive impatience too, um, as well as uh, new materials for our syllabuses. And um, mm -hmm. that's, I think, perhaps a uh, a theme that we can return to. Um, John Burroughs is next up. Uh, all the information is at the website. Michelle, do come back in if- I just wanna say that there was in the chat that Muscotis, which is by the way, where my people are from, cultural college micro learning series open to the public. Uh, yeah. Um, so if you just go to Muscogee's Cultural College, you should be able to find that. And that is the other thing is there's lots of Indigenous cultural and educational institutions that you can use as a resource as teachers. So thank you so much again for welcoming me and for being here. All of the, the people who have joined us today, thank you for your desire to learn, to understand and to um, and to be with us tonight. I certainly appreciate it. And we'll look forward to seeing you with John Burroughs. <laughs> Thanks so much, Michelle. Thanks for including.